and we are officially live, and we are very privileged to have Megan Sullivan all the way from Southern California in the USA. And Megan, you are what one would call an adventurer and a life embracer. Were you <laughs> always an adventurer? Were you always a life embracer? Or was it because of a culmination of events, some serendipitous uh, collection of things that made you become a life embracer? Yeah, definitely. I, um, I've always very much enjoyed life, but like everyone, you kind of go through different patterns in your life where maybe you're not seeking out you know, all the adventures that you always dream of seeking out. And it wasn't until about a year ago, a year and a half ago, that I had what people would call the trifecta of bad luck. Um, I am a rock climber, and I was climbing in Yosemite Valley in California. Uh, there's this big climb called uh, the Nose Route of El Capitan, and I was about 2,000 feet up the climb when I fell 50 feet. And uh, not too sure how I survived that, but I did. But when I got back down to the ground, I uh, I kind of changed my perspective on on why I was pursuing those type of, types of climbs and why I was putting myself in those high-risk situations and kind of reevaluating my life choices a little but, bit. But now um, you, you just, for a second, you, you fell. Were you still attached to ropes and, and you were kind of hanging or did you actually fall 50, me, uh, 50 feet? Yeah, so in traditional style climbing called trad climbing, I was doing a big wall. So you'd use aid technique, so it's another style of climbing called aid climbing. And so you put in your own gear as you're climbing up, and I got in a position where I ran out of gear. So I was what you would call leapfrogging my gear. So uh -huh. I would plug in a piece, and then and get to the higher out. plug in, and then take that one out, and then go up, take that one out, and then I got in a position where I trusted some fixed gear, so that's gear that has been put there in the past, and you never know how long it's been there, so you should never trust it. <laughs> and I had trusted it, and then I, I fell, and you know, falling and climbing, you don't like to fall, but usually you have your protection in there to catch you, and what happened was, it was the series of events of the fixed gear breaking on me. And then since I had leapfrogged all of my gear below me, I had run out the climb about 25 feet. So then including rope stretch, I wow. basically tumbled down and, uh, and then was caught mending up air. Uh, and then uh, what's, what was unfortunate about that is then, so here I am, 2,000 feet up. I just fell 50 feet, which is just unheard of. Like, you don't fall that far. And, and then, is, um, is, but is, I still had to heights. Huh? I'll say 50 feet is is approximately maybe 15, 16 meters, and that's yeah. that's a quite a large fall. Yeah, yeah. And then I still had to get down, so that took about five hours of uh, repelling down because my climbing partner was like, he was the most scared out of anyone um, in the situation. I was I was in a little shock, like. I'm more grateful that I was alive. Um, and he was like, we need to get you down immediately. Uh, there's no way you're okay. You have to have a broken bone. You have to have a concussion. So we need to get you down immediately. But it's not that easy. You have to, we're already 2,000 feet up, so we had to wrap down. So we had to repel down um, numerous pitches by that point. And so that took a good five hours. And then, you know, got on the ground and then, drove back to the city to get into, to go to the doctors to make sure it was okay. <laughs> and you had no, and no serious injuries? Sign. Huh? No serious injuries? No serious injuries, just badly, badly bruised. I, I looked, I looked very, I didn't look great. <laughs> but now did you, did you then start thinking, should I be doing this sort of activity because it's a great risk? Or like any surfer that gets uh, frightened by a shark, you get straight back in the water and, and off you go the next weekend. So yeah, I was, I was the first part. I was I was the questioning why I was putting myself in those situations because I had been seeking out to to accomplish this climb for about three or four years. Meaning I would go to Yosemite Valley every weekend 
Um, so I have a full-time job. So in the States, we call it being a weekend warrior, where you, uh, you get off at, you know, leave the city around 8 p.m. on a Friday, drive straight to Yosemite Valley, which is about a three-and-a-half-hour drive for me, climb all weekend, come back and be at the office Monday morning. And so I had basically, you know, missed thousands, not thousands, um, <laughs> a lot of birthday parties, a lot of vacations with family, because I was just so dead set on climbing. That's, that's all I thought about. That's all I wanted to do. And, you know, when I fell, it was kind of that realization of, it's just, why? Why am I doing this? Like, what? why am I putting myself in these positions? And, and really trying to, you know, stand back and think, is, is this climb worth the risk? And that's what I had I'm to sure ask myself. I'm sure your family were asking that question every time you went oh. up the first time. <laughs> My family thinks I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> that is <laughs> <Don't> even... <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah, so cool. my mom and I had this agreement. She's like, every time I'd go climbing, I would have to call her on the way back in. And she was following me very closely for this climb. And, and of course, I text her around 3 a.m., uh, and that was a Monday, when I got off the climb. And I just simply texted her, like, I'm safe, uh, headed back to San Francisco. And she knew something went wrong because... <laughs> He knew that I was supposed to summit that that next day, and so it was too early. She knew that if I like, she just knew. So she called me first thing in the morning. She's like, "What is wrong? <laughs> is everything okay?" I'm like, "I'm fine. I'm fine." <laughs> that is just incredible. Wow. So now you you go and you do this big climb, and yeah. it it didn't go so well. It went a little bit pear shaped, but but then something else happened after that just to. To complicate things a little bit, what happened exactly. then? So, so here I was, you know, the first day I'm in that kind of shock mode because another thing is uh, it wasn't just the physical pain of falling, but it was the emotional pain of failing at a dream that I had been working so hard towards for the last three or four years. And that was, that was a big ego crush for me because – you know, when you work that hard at something, you just you expect to finish. You expect to accomplish that goal. And when you don't, you kind of, you know, reevaluate and you're mad at yourself and you replay every single thing you did and like what could have I done to change that outcome? And so that's kind of where I was mentally. And then a few days later, you know, I got better. I was able to walk again. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, started to reevaluate things. I decided, I talked to my twin, I have a twin brother, talked to him a lot, and was just like, you know, maybe I just need to take a little break on climbing and, you know, <laughs> hang out with my family, my nieces and nephews. Um, and sure enough, that next following Monday, so exactly a week later, I have this, like, really great, like, yeah, okay, everything's great, and I'm riding my best butt to work. And then I got hit by a car on the way, which was crazy. And um, that's kind of when everything just I think that was the most emotional time for me because it was the, all right, I survived that fall. I'm finally in a good mental place where it's like, all right, I survived it. I'm great, you know. And then I got hit by a car. And then it was that moment where I'm on the side of the street the first person I call is my twin brother because he's my best friend, uh -huh. and I just broke down on the side of the on the side of the road, just crying and just like I don't know what's going on. I don't know why the universe is just slapping this. <laughs> Wait, and then so of course I'm just crying, and my twin is like, "Go to the hospital! Stop crying!" Like, call nine one one. Common sense. Common sense. Call, call the medic. What's going on? I'm like, no, no, no. I think I'm okay. Like I can, I can walk. My leg really hurts, but no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm call. Okay, yeah, I'll call nine one one. So then, uh, yeah, so then I went to the ER, and and again, besides all the bruises that I had from the week of falling off the mountain, where my doctor was like, "Are you okay? You're covered in bruises." I was like, "Oh, yeah, I just fell off a mountain last week." <laughs> like, and then I also got knocked out by a car. 
Wow. So it was pretty funny. That conversation was great. And so I got all x-rayed up, and, and again, somehow I was, I was fine. I, I just super badly bruised. But then again, like the mental like life decision questions started coming in again, like why am I driving a Vespa in San Francisco? It's one of the most dangerous things you can do. But I'm like, why? I mean, is this the universe telling me that I'm making bad life decisions, that I'm putting myself into risky situations when they're avoidable? And so I had a lot of, like, internal, like, ah, what am I doing? Do I just need to go and lock myself in a room? And, and then it was my, my stepfather. He was actually, he jokingly sent me a giant plastic bubble that you could buy off of Amazon. Uh -huh. to protect yourself. And he was like, I think we need to buy you one of these big bubbles. <laughs> Those zorbs, I think they call the, the padded balls. I know what you're talking about. And, and I'm sure you appreciated that. <laughs> wow. So it was kind of a family joke. Like, I mean, they, they felt, obviously, they're terrified for me and very worried. But at the same time, they were all in the same kind of, all right, I think it's time for you to... Um, to chill out <laughs> and be a little bit more safe. And then, uh, yeah, and then a couple days later, I went in for a routine doctor's check to get my skin checked for, uh, for cancerous moles. And, you know, there was something a little suspicious right here, so I got a biopsy. And, of course, and that's still, like, they take out a piece of your skin. And uh -huh. I had to go to L.A. for a shoot that I was working on the next day. And I was like, man, I have a huge... <laughs> like band right here. I was like, seriously, I'm covered in bruises. Now I have a bandage here. I have to go to LA and work with a team. Uh, you know, what's going on? And then um, the following Monday after that, sure enough, I got the call from my doctor that said it was cancerous and that we had to go wow. in and get it surgically removed right away. And so how you know, was when that you get a call like that? How did you how did you react to that news? I mean, how how does a doctor break that kind of news to you? Yeah, I mean, it was very it was very surreal. So you know, you get the call, and you're just expecting the routine call. You know, you're expecting the oh, we got it checked out. You know, um, everything's great. Uh, just wear sunscreen, and mm -hmm. that was just what I was expecting. And instead, it was that you know, telling me that I had this skin cancer that I had to get removed. But then my mind didn't really put two and two together, and then I had to stop her mid-conversation and and just say, "Wait, wait, what? What? What did you say?" And again, it was just so fast, and and I was working. I was on set for a, a shoot that I was doing, um, and it was it was definitely one of those surreal moments where I felt kind of like outside of my body, like just. What is going on? Because at that point, it had been exactly three Mondays in a row. And, wow. I mean, everyone says bad luck comes in threes. <laughs> so, and, well, people say um, Mondays are the worst. I mean, bad Mondays, putting the two together, I mean, it's just an awful combination. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. And then, um, luckily, my family, um, my stepfather, he's an oncologist, so he's a cancer specialist. So immediately I got on the phone with him and my mom, who's also in healthcare. And and they they were my support system and you know they let me know you know this is this is really great that you caught it this early um, you know I asked them as well my family lives in Seattle Washington and I was in San Francisco at the time mm -hmm. and so you know I was making sure I'm like, should I go to a doctor here in San Francisco or should I fly up there and they're like no 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 San Francisco's great <laughs> you're gonna be great my mom flew down to be with me during the surgery and and you know. After that, I started to realize that all these events, I, I survived all these events. So it, it kind of skewed my mindset into, you know, I'm putting myself in these lives, like these kind of risky situations, but at the same time, I'm doing things that I love that really give me happiness inside. I love to climb. I love riding my Vespa. You know, I love being outside. But I think what that month really did for me was that it showed the real risks that are, are, that are involved in these life decisions that you make. But learning from them is what you can take away from these instances. So I learned, like, 
I need to start wearing sunscreen all the time. I'm so thankful that I got my skin checked and I was able to, able to remove the cancer right away so it didn't spread. And, you know, climbing, I'm, I'm now reevaluating the risks that I'm taking. You know, maybe I don't go on such an ambitious climb if I don't feel ready. Um, Vespa, you know, riding my Vespa, it's the you cannot predict driver's behavior. So now I'm driving a lot slower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I've learned from that month where it's like life is really short. If you are going to, you know, take big risks, realize that there are, you know, consequences if you don't respect those risks. And that's what I really took away from that month, and um, which then led me to kind of live more every day, which was the, you know, I'm super lucky to be alive, and I want to live each day to its fullest. Okay, but now, I mean, we all want to, well, maybe not everyone, but, but most people want to live their life to the fullest, and, and I would like to think that, you know, if I drop dead tomorrow, I have zero regrets, because yes. I've done... Most, I'd say about 95% of all the things I've ever wanted to do, I've actually managed to do. Uh, the people that I've wanted to connect with, you know, I'm a big geek, so when it comes to space and, you know, getting to, to actually meet the head of NASA and astronauts and, you know, I, I've got to do all of that and I don't stop because there are only 24 hours in the day. I mean, I just carry on and on because I'm doing exactly what I love. So I, I get yeah. you. Uh, and not many people get us. You know, there are yeah. not a lot of people... <laughs> who can understand why I can get by with two hours sleep and still be incredibly passionate and enthusiastic the next day because I'm doing what I love. So they're very, we're a rare species. But you decided, well, you know what? I've always had this dream of going to travel, but in particular, you were always keen to hit the seven new wonders of the world. Why those particular spots? So it's a pretty funny story. Um, I about like four years ago, I was doing the thing where I was on Facebook, and you know when you get you kind of you're looking at your friends, and then your friend is with somebody else, and you're like, oh, who's that person? And you click on that person, and then before you know it, you're looking at some random girl's profile picture that you have no idea who she is, but she was standing in front of this amazing place. I'm like, what? Where is that? I've seen that a few times. And I realized it was Machu Picchu in Peru. And I immediately, again, looking at this, I wish I knew this girl's name <laughs> so I could give her credit, but just looking at this random, um, she was a rock climber's uh, profile picture, I saw her standing in front of Machu Picchu, and I was, I was just thinking, I need to go there. So upon uh, further research, I realized that it was part of the new Seven Wonders of the World, and instantly it just clicked, and I thought, you know what would be really cool is if I could travel to all seven wonders in one go, in one trip, and document it in a really cool way. Because um, I'm a filmmaker and I love making videos, and I I'm very inspired by by kind of the short two minute fun videos. And I had just seen one um, that it was by uh, Casey. Uh, He's like a famous YouTuber, and he did one for Nike that was called Make It Count, and it was where he traveled the world in like 10 days and did this really cool video, and I was totally inspired by that, and I was like, man, I wonder if I could think of something cool like that, and and that's what planted the seed, and you know, for the next like three years, you know, I dove into rock climbing, and that was pretty much all I was doing, and then after those events, I, I kind of realized something huge, which was... You know, when tragedy hits somebody, it opens up this, this chance for change because it, it provides this void. So here I was climbing every single weekend where I didn't really allow myself to pursue my dreams because I was so distracted by this other goal. And the moment that I lost that goal, even though it was super devastating at the time because I had tried so hard to accomplish this goal, it opened up this void. It opened up this space to be filled. And immediately, once this space was open, I allowed myself to follow another path, which was, what have I been really dreaming about doing? It was like the Seven Wonders trip. I've had this on the back of my mind since before I started climbing. And yeah, I'm going to do it. And it, and it was a, a hike that I did in Lake Tahoe um, where I finally had this vision for the video. And it was you know, following somebody 
across the world, going to all seven wonders and filming it and then cutting it in this way where you could kind of experience that whole trip in two minutes. And then book the tickets, what, two weeks later? <laughs> so now, you obviously went online and you looked for the cheapest flights you could find. Um, and, I mean, you don't know much about all these places, so you've got to do a little bit of homework. Um, you've got to go on to the, the digital versions of or equivalents of the Lonely Planet and, and that type of thing to, to find out what is it you want to see, but you were literally going to see seven places in 13 days. That means yeah. you are literally only there for eight to ten hours at one location. Yeah. So, I mean, even to get to certain places takes an hour or two. So how did you maximize all the sites in, in one day? I mean, I, I mean, that takes a lot of planning. Exactly. So luckily I'm a producer uh, for my career. So I, I plan very large scale video shoots. Um, and so scheduling for me is kind of comes with my nature. And, and you know, I've been an active traveler all my life. So I basically started, well, first everyone asks why just 13 days. And mm -hmm. again, you know, to pay for a trip like this, you have to have a job. And my job doesn't like to give a lot of time off of work. So 13 days was literally all the time I could actually get off of work um, and still have a job when I got back. So that's, that's why I did it in 13 days. And then also, um, I understand too, for a lot of people, this is like their worst nightmare, just being on a plane for like the whole time. But, you know, for me, it wasn't so much about experiencing the little, like the individual locations. Um, it was more about the film projects. So me, my mindset was the film. Like it was the, you know, like this is the biggest shoot that I've ever planned in my life. And and that, that was my mindset. It wasn't the mindset of I want to experience every single culture in every one of these countries. Um, it was more of the, this is the film project, and then I'm going to come back to all these cultures and experience them when I have more time. <laughs> but the, the my mindset was there. I get that question a lot of, why would you why would you go to all these places so fast and not really experience them and it was the you know it wasn't this kind of trip like this trip was the film project that was my goal and I only had 13 days that was the only time I could get off of work and I really wanted to finish this video so that was my mindset um, so for for planning it um, it was it was actually surprisingly pretty simple I uh, I used Google so three years ago I or four years ago now I, I had already mapped out. So when I came up with the idea, I had already mapped it out on Google Maps to see like where the airport was to where the wonder was and how like how long I would need to get there and do it. And my calculations back then, 4 years prior was that I needed at least 22 days. <laughs> so <laughs> then I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, let's let's see how I can cut some days out. And one of the big things was big things was uh, doing the trek in Peru. So there's this sock and tie trek that you can do that I really wanted to do. And luckily I was actually able to do it the year before. So I had already knocked that out. Um, so that, that saved me about seven days. And uh, so yeah, so I basically would find the airport. I would calculate how long by using, you know, just searching flights, like how long it takes to get from Brazil to Rome. And then factor in that time that you need there to get to the Colosseum and then back. So it was just this big spreadsheet. And, um, and then using Skyscanner.com, that's kind of my favorite um, <laughs> current like internet search. I don't know. It might be out of date now, but back then it was like my favorite one because it would do inter all international flights. So, yeah, so basically I – yeah, planned all the trips. Um, it took like two hours, and I booked all the plane tickets and, and crossed my fingers and knew that it was going to be the most ultimate adventure because, no joke, I had no clue if I was actually going to be able to pull this off. It wasn't one of, I didn't go on the trip thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to get to China in 13 days, and it's going to be great. It was the, oh, I hope this works because I have no clue. Wow. Well, I mean... What you're saying is is not. I mean, when you when you say that you know to do uh, seven sp specific spots in 13 days very quick, 
Kontiki have been doing that for years. So young students go over to Europe, they go and see 15 countries in nine days or 10 days, they literally whisk through it and yeah. for the same reason because they get a taste of what it's all about. So one day when yeah. they do want to go back, they know exactly which things they liked and which things they didn't like. So exactly. that part I get. But now, you might be a great planner, but as you know, life often deals very different cards. So yeah. were there any times where flights did not take place or the airport was closed, or was a public holiday, or, or the, the, the taxi couldn't get you to the airport in time, and then your plans started changing. Right. Yeah, so, um, you know, I did account for that. So I would account for, you know, delays. Um, being, again, an experienced travel, uh, traveler, I knew that there was undoubtedly would be some delays. And, um, and so at the back end of the trip, I had... I had padded a lot of days, like given an extra day in India, um, which ended up being awesome because when we were in Jordan leaving Petra, uh, we got stuck in an ice storm. And so then we met, missed our connection. And they never have ice storms. So they didn't know how to de-ice the plane. It was, like, it, was this, it was this craziness. Um, so we were on fly to buy. And luckily that airline was awesome because they just – we were on the tarmac for about five hours. We were just stuck in the plane on the tarmac. And luckily they gave us free TV and, and free food and, you know, so it was it was fine. Uh, but we missed our connection and so we ended up having to go to Dubai for an unexpected, you know, seven hours. And then got into India, New Delhi, um, about, gosh, I want to say about 14 hours late. And... So what happened then was for the Taj Mahal, we got there on a fr was it Friday that the ta Taj Mahal is closed? We have some people from India. Is it Friday? Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. find out. We have uh, Tessa and of course Sebastian both in India. When does the Taj Mahal close? Maybe you can text us and, and let us know. <laughs> is it closed on a Friday? I would assume that at one o'clock. There would be uh, the prayers, so I can't imagine. Maybe they open up afterwards. I'm not sure. Let's see if they know. Tessa, do you know? Sebastian, do you know if the? Let's see. Friday it is closed because it's yeah. Just, okay. Yeah, it's Thank closed you. On Friday. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, so we got there, and it's 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 the one day of the week that it's closed completely, and it was the one day that we had because we had lost a day pretty much because of the ice storm in Jordan. But luckily, they have these amazing gardens on the other side with this amazing view of the Taj Mahal. So it, it was actually, it was really cool. And so we went there. You know, I got the shot that I needed for the video. And um, then, you know, we raced back into New Delhi. I had a friend of a colleague that was there. So she took us out to this amazing dinner. Um, and then we got on our flight to China. So that was our only big hiccup. <laughs> Um, oh, and in Jordan, they they confiscated my tripod uh, because That's they thought I was. That's a big problem. <laughs> I mean, as a filmmaker, and and you're obviously filming a lot of things when you put the tripod down and you stand there and get in the shot. Yeah. And now they've taken your tripod. Why would they take your tripod? Yeah. Well, they thought that it was it could be used as a weapon. Um, because when it breaks down, it, it would break out down to like this big. So it kind of uh -huh. did look like a club of some sort. And I was like, no, 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 no. Picture, picture. Like it's it's a tripod, like not a weapon. And uh, they didn't believe me at all. So then um, I, uh, yeah, so then I had to get really creative with the last two countries. So in India, like I put the camera up on some stacked rocks. And then in China, I put it on top of a trash can. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Improvising. Now, of all the places you went to, what are the seven places that you went to visit? There was the Christ so Redeemer. Okay, you, you tell us. Which were the seven places that you went to in, in, in the order yeah. that you went? Okay, so I started in San Francisco. That's where I live. And then I went to Mexico. Mexico, sorry, Mexico, to Chichen Itza, which is the Mayan pyramid there, mm -hmm. and then went to uh, Cusco uh, to in Peru to go to Machu Picchu, 
and then flew into Brazil to go to Christ the Redeemer in Rio, and then flew to Rome to go see the Colosseum, then flew to, uh, to Jordan to go to Petra, and then went to India to see the Taj Mahal, and then finished up in China to see the Great Wall of China. So you literally made a movement across the, yes. the, the, okay, and that was obviously it made sense to move and not go backwards and forwards, but you know, e yeah. even when we say that, from a time point of view, uh, it makes no sense, but from a cost point of view, there's this ridiculous situation where sometimes it's cheaper to fly from one spot to another and then back again than to fly directly to that spot because of economy of scale and, and flights leaving from one spot to another. I mean, yeah. if money's an issue, then you have to make those sorts of decisions. Yeah. But now you get to these places, you've been dreaming about them. Did you feel a little disappointed with any of the places that did not live up to your expectations? And did any of them surpass your expectations? Yeah, I think, you know, the coolest thing about this experience is that it was the people that I was surrounding myself with. So the coolest moment was to be at each one of these places. So keep in mind, I had the unique ability to see the world in less than two weeks and moving from different countries to a different continent. You start to realize how small this world really is and how easy it became to communicate with everyone. And because, you know, at first you're a little like, oh, how is my Spanish? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and then and you get kind of like subconscious, I mean, um, subconscious about, you know, communicating with people and the taxi drivers and everything. And then, you know, halfway through your trip, you just realize that we're all human and we all live in this amazing world together. And, and communicating started to become easier and easier um, with each country that we started to visit. And um, so the, the coolest moment of the whole trip was, was just that overarching experience of meeting people from all over the world and seeing the, their eyes when they're looking at this amazing, you know, the Colosseum or Taj Mahal, and you're looking at their eyes and they're just, you know, they might have traveled really far or, you know, really short distances just to be in, in the presence of something truly extraordinary. And being around people from all over the world was it was a really unique and amazing opportunity to experience But now, that. obviously, the people factor is important, and, and I think yeah. that sometimes you need to go somewhere to realize that we have that at home as well, and, and maybe I just didn't spend enough time with people to know that I enjoyed that. But now, when yeah. you actually got to those places, the Taj Mahal, I mean, you see all these photographs, you, 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 you kind of picture the Facebook version, and then you're standing yeah. there, and you have the sense you have the, the humidity, you have the, the reality of actually being there. So, so there must have been certain things that when you went to go and see, you thought, meh, I mean, it's nice, but I mean, it's, it's just a statue, it's just a, just a hill. I mean, it, did you experience that at all? I think the only one that I was a little, you know, meh about was, um, was just uh, maybe Christ the Redeemer. But that was more of the fact that the the place where you stand to to witness it and be right under it is so small. And we were there on January first, so we we're there on New Year's <laughs> Day. <laughs> oh, so it's it insane! <laughs> so crowded that it. And I don't know if you if you watch the video again, you can tell that it's not included in the little series of the walking series that I put. Because there was no space. Like, we were like sardines. Like, looking at up. And I got one shot of, um, of us in front of it holding up a number. But that was, that was the only thing. It was about 100 degrees. It was hot. There were a million people there in a very small space to look up. And then it was like getting hit by a selfie stick like every two seconds. Uh, yeah. So that, no, I would say that was the only one, um, just because of the experience, it was a little harder. But the statue is, is beautiful. It's amazing. Um, but I, I would say that was, that was the only one where you got there, and it was, it was a little hard to be in awe just because there was so much chaos around. <laughs> but now, what about getting to uh, Petra, for example? That must have been a real eye-opener. 
That was amazing. I felt like I was on the set of Indiana Jones. Uh, it was so <laughs> cool. You walk in, and there's this little, like, eye like cave that you kind of walk in, and then you just see it, and it's it's straight. You feel like you're on a set of a movie. It's it's just it's unreal. And so you just kind of, like, walk in, and you just open up to this other dimension of another world, and it's it's so cool. And that whole park, I mean, we could have stayed there for five days, you know, exploring the caves and and all the other little um, artifacts that they had there. It was it was it was really cool. Petra was awesome. Wow. Now I know we've got a couple of questions from some of the people who are participating and I must just check the emails to see if there are any email questions through. But I know Tessa, you definitely want to ask one or two questions. So do you want to unmute yourself and ask and I know Shannon also wants to ask some questions as well. So Tessa you can go first. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello, ma'am. A great privilege for me to talk to you. Um, I don't know whether I have the qualification even to congratulate you, but I wish to congratulate you for the enthusiasm to defeat every problems that come against man in his life, every person in his life. Normally or usually, every people get scared or start or even start crying, or others will start crying. When they know that they have a small disease, even me, I also cry at uh, some situation. But you are a living example of good example that man can do everything. So you showed that you will never get tired, no matter what happens. Um, so you are a model, a role model for everyone. I take on you as my role model after knowing about you. And more, I can read you, ma'am. So, can I move to the question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, when I was reading about you, I noticed this sentence. I'm just recording it. Uh, during your routine checkup, you uh, came to know that uh, you are having skin cancer. It seems that uh, uh, checkup is a routine for you. So. Uh, what was your feeling? What, were, what was your experience at that worst moment? What was I feeling? Hello? Yeah. At, at your, I mean, obviously, that was your, your after your, your, your trifecta, that was like the, 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 the lowest point uh, of, of the trifecta. Um, she wants to know pretty much how you're feeling at, at that point um, in your life. Yeah, I think... Um, by that point, it was kind of the first, I mean, the third big hit. Um, and I, I really thought, well, there's no way it can get any worse. <laughs> so it can only really get better from here. And, you know, given the first two instances, I, I was already in that mindset of where I was kind of questioning a lot of things. And... And so I went through, I went through some mood swings, you know. It was, it was definitely, I went through the the why, why am I, why am I getting handed this bad luck, um, to then, you know, the amazing realization that I, I was surviving, you know, that I was still able to walk, you know, um, I'm a very athletic person, and one of those events could have easily, you know, I could have broken a leg, I could have even been paralyzed, you know, and what was awesome was I, I, I looked on the, the, the bright end of it, you know, I, I realized that even though I had these really bad things happen, I still had my legs, like I was still able to walk and, you know, and I was still in control of how I was going to live that day. And, you know, I've been in other situations where life has just handed me a really, really, some really bad news and you're in control of how you're going to deal with that. And, you know, I, I choose every day to be happy because um, it's really easy to get frustrated with life and it's really easy to get sad with, you know, things that happen around you that you can't control. But what you can control is your mindset and how you're going to live that day. That's a very good answer. And, I mean, as Tessa said, you know, she feels that you're obviously a very good role model and, and, and that's what it is. It's about choosing the positives. But, I mean, 
to, to actually go ahead and embark on a journey like this, it costs money. And I know Shannon wanted to ask some questions about the budget. So Shannon, if you want to unmute yourself, I know she switched off her webcam, but if you want to unmute yourself, maybe you want to ask the question yourself, or shall I ask on your behalf? She might have disappeared. No? <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll ask on her behalf. No, she's come back. So Shannon, would you like to ask the question about um, the budget? I know you were interested in the budget, so you can just unmute yourself. There we go. Hello. Hi, can everyone man. hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes. Hello. Sorry about that. It's my first time to use handout, so I'm not sure about the function yet. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, great, glad that you share your story because your story can inspire my students. Uh, actually, uh, some of my students are from the children's house. They've been abandoned from their family. So some of my students, they are kind of really have less motivation about their life. And I think I'm going to tell them your story <laughs> to try to motivate them and to share the idea how you go through all your hard time. Yeah. But I'm quite curious, how would you uh, use limit budget uh, to travel in Third in Great Wonderlands <laughs> because I'm going to Seattle this summer. So I'm thinking, how am I going to do to make my trip more pleasant <laughs> and I can still save my money too? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> these are good questions. That, these are very good questions, Shannon. And and of course, Shannon, where about are you at the moment? Pardon? Where are you located? Oh, I'm in Taiwan. She's in Taiwan. Okay. So Shannon in Taiwan yeah. would like to know a little bit more about how to get that budget to stretch a little bit further. Yeah. So um, the biggest thing that I always tell people is uh, it's, it's savings, really. Uh, I have been saving for this trip kind of unknowingly. I had been, I'd been kind of putting away a lot of money to travel and because I knew that's what I wanted to do. So that um, – that, that was basically five years of me saving as much as I could. And and what I tell people is, you know, after that trip too, you start to realize that where you find your happiness. So if if you find your happiness from goods, like buying a new pair of jeans, you know, and whatnot, that's awesome. You know, buy those new pair of jeans. And um, for me, I don't find my happiness there. I, I find my happiness um, in life experiences. So I, I love to travel. So I like to save for those things. But that also means that I have to give up, you know, not buying clothes all the time and not, you know, joining in on, you know, concerts and, and movies and things like that so I can save as much as possible. So, you know, it, it's kind of cliche to say, but, you know, when there is a will, there is a way. And I am a huge saver. And even to the point where I started to offload everything in my studio that I hadn't, you know, touched or used in about six months and sold it on eBay. eBay is awesome. I was, <laughs> I was able to sell a lot of old, you know, Patagonia jackets and realizing that I only need one jacket. I don't need, you know, a lot. And um, sold a bunch of stuff to raise some money and then kind of left that experience knowing that um, I don't need a lot of materialistic goods. So I, I live a very simple lifestyle now and, you know, travel very light. I don't own a lot. And that um, allows me to save for, you know, the next big adventure. So savings is huge. Wow. But now, I, I mean, saving is, is good, but uh, finding good deals on the Internet is, is critical. Yes. So you, yes. you said you had one or two techniques that of, of finding yeah. or do not like to share them because then if everyone yeah. else does it, then all of a sudden you lose out on all those deals. Oh, no, no. I'm happy to share. <laughs> I still have about that knowledge here. Um, so skyscanner.com, and I, so I don't even, I don't work for them. <laughs> I, I honestly, that's what I use all the time. What, why I use them is because they have this great function where you can put what your home airport is. So mine's San Francisco, and then I can put in my dates, and then I can go travel anywhere, and it will show me where's the cheapest flight wow. anywhere in the world. 
So I love them for that. And also they have a price calendar as well. So, you know, if your dates are flexible, you can see, you can save thousands by just traveling certain dates other than, than others. And then as for, you know, hotels, I use hostelworld.com. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic because they, they have the best hostels in every city, and those are very, very inexpensive. Um, and another thing is Airbnb. I know that's getting super popular worldwide. Mm -hmm. I, I actually use Airbnb to rent out my place where I'm gone, and so usually it's kind of like a home exchange because I, you know, rent mine out to, to basically make money to go then stay at someone else's across the world. So those are my little my little hats. So Airbnb. So there we go, Shannon. Airbnb will certainly make a difference. But I mean, one thing I have found is that sometimes you you do a search for a flight, and and it certainly happens in in South Africa. You do a search for a flight, and you get a certain price, and you think, mm, let me go check another airline, and then you lose that page, and you go back on, and you do the identical search, and it's and they it. three minutes later. And there's an extra thousand rand. I think there's an algorithm written to do that. Oh yeah, we were just talking about this yesterday. You gotta clear your cookies, clear your uh, cash. You see, now there's another when technique. Okay, Shannon. So remember that when you are booking <laughs> flights, clear your cash because they are very sneaky. They know that you've been on that yeah. site. They know what you're looking for, so they put in a, a more expensive flight in just because then you realize, well, I, I need the flight. I am desperate. Boom, and they hit you with that. Yeah. And then sometimes, sometimes I uh, I actually call the airline as well, and sometimes they help out. You know, if I found a flight and and I was about to check out, but something happens, I'll sometimes call. Um, you know, British British Airways was really cool with me. I because the same thing happened. It, it almost doubled in price, uh -huh. and and I was like, wait, I I was in the checkout, and then something a glitch happened. I was you know da da da, and then. They were really cool. So sometimes a phone call and just being very nice to people goes a long way. There we go. So Shannon, you are going to have the cheapest flights. You're going to have to sell everything at home. <laughs> you, won't, you won't have any home to come back to, but at least you can get to Seattle. I can't promise you're going to get back, but at least you, you're going to get yourself there, and it will be much cheaper than you were hoping to get there. All right. Are there any other questions? I know maybe Govinda in Nepal. Do you have a question? I know you're there with your daughter. And oh, and Eli has joined us from from Australia. I'm just going to put you on mute. How do we do it? Absolutely. Uh, I'll mute you. Don't worry, Eli. There we go. I've muted you. Okay. So Eli is in Australia, and he's joining us as well. And uh, so we've got Australia, India, Taiwan, Nepal. Lema is also there from Lithuania. Lema, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask a question as well. And oh, and Tessa. I know that you were quite keen to ask a question as well. So, do you want to ask another question? You can just unmute yourself. Yes. Um, so, what else to say? Uh, next question I want to ask is that uh, you describe Petra and Jordan as modern wonder. Uh, Megan, ma'am. Yeah, we we, we listening. Yeah. I'm again my read your blog. And you described Petra. Uh, I I thought I thought right. So uh, is the is it the way that it was built or else what's the reason? Ma'am. I'm not sure. We can we we're not really hearing you very clearly. I don't know, Megan. Are you? Can you hear it clearly? Because uh, there's I a lot of echo. There's a lot of echo. Maybe Tess, if you want to type the question uh, in the text box, and then we'll try and oh, read yes. it out. We'll read it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what what I find fascinating is that you you've obviously made this amazing set of journeys, but if I recall correctly, you've just come back from Nepal. Yeah. And you were only just there for a short. Tell us a little bit about that. That was actually that was a long trip. That, so that was about um, three weeks total. Oh, so I did that was a uh, yeah yeah. That was a long trip. So that was a that was a trip I really wanted to experience, and um, I wanted to shoot a little documentary. So that was another film project, and I I traveled to the the three passes of Everest. It's a a hundred mile loop 
Um, and it goes over these great three passes, which gives you this spectacular view of the Himalayas. And um, shot a lot of video of that, so I'm currently working on that piece now. So hopefully, you know, in addition to my real job, I can be able to cut that shortly. <laughs> Wow. Well, I know that when, when all the earthquakes took place in, in Nepal, you know, I, I say we're fortunate because, you know, we had uh, Govinda who was reporting to all of us because we all work as a group of teachers. There are about 200 of us on the HLW group and, and we all wanted to know that everyone in Nepal were okay and, and obviously Govinda was giving us feedback and telling us what was happening at the time and, and, and then obviously he, he was explaining some of the devastation. And, and while you were there, did you still see a lot of that devastation? Yeah, but more amazingly, I saw the resilience of the people there in Nepal, who are absolutely amazing, beautiful human beings, and they have the best attitude in the world. And, and that, was, that was awesome. And I think what I took away from that was, you know, they are still rebuilding, uh, but they desperately want visitors because it is a very travel-based industry there. And to encourage people to experience the beauty that surrounds Nepal is is the best thing we can do for that country right now. And so, um, yeah, I, the devastation is still there, but it's it's you know the attitudes are amazing, and I would encourage anyone to travel there because it's probably the most breathtaking views I've ever witnessed. Wow. Well, I mean, okay, so apart from Cape Town being your favorite city in the world, what, what city comes next after that? Um, what, what have I done since? No, 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 I'm saying apart from Cape Town being your favorite city in the whole world, oh. <laughs> what, what city comes next after that? Um, well, if I don't say Seattle, my hometown will be very upset, so mm -hmm. I am born and raised from Seattle, Washington, um, so Shannon, you'll have a great time there. It's absolutely beautiful, so I would have to say that my favorite city is my hometown, Seattle. <laughs> but now, on all your travels that you've been, uh, have you been to Europe? Have you, have yes. you spent time in Eastern Europe? Eastern Europe, um, a little a little bit, yeah. I, so I lived in London for a year. I went to film school there. Oh, so and you so travel all to Europe. Travel a bit. <laughs> so you are, you're actually quite a traveler. I mean, you really have done, uh, I mean, which, which parts of the world have you not been to that you still want to go to? I really want to go to Iceland. I want to see the Northern Lights. I know uh, so the that's on my list. But you uh, can do that in the US. Yeah, but Iceland is awesome. There's apparently so. <laughs> the, the Scandinavian countries apparently are awesome as well to see the Northern yeah. Lights. A lot of people go to Norway to go and, and, and I've seen photographs of, from a friend of mine and they were, I mean, that it's not a bucket list thing. It, it, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. <laughs> that is definitely something that I, I'm planning to do because, for me, that's something that that's spectacular. The Northern Lights are just absolutely incredible. I want to see them. <laughs> and you can do that in what? In, in nine hours? I mean, how long is the flight? You only need one hour in, in Iceland <laughs> no, yeah. with your travel schedule. You know, when I, I think I'd want to explore a little bit more in that one and have some cool adventure. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm hoping maybe in the fall that I can take two weeks off. Um, I, I'll have to ask my boss upstairs. <laughs> and what about food? You're not a vegetarian because most people from California are. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, if you are, do you eat meat? I do eat meat. So, yeah. so what were the most unusual things you got to eat on your travels, or did you just stick to the safest bets in in all the places that you went to? I, I stayed with pretty safe meal choices uh, because I really didn't want to get sick in such a short amount of time. So, um, you know, kind of overarching, I always stay away from dairy uh, just because I, I personally, I'm, I, my body doesn't like dairy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's kind of huge. And then, um, yeah, I usually just stick to pretty simple foods when I'm traveling. And I, I'm not one of those, I'm not the food adventurist. Some people peg me because I like to climb things and whatnot that I would be one of those people who likes to eat eyeballs and weird things and I, I don't. Not your thing. Not <laughs> that's, your where, thing. that's where I draw my line of adventuring. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do know some people who've traveled overseas and, and 
when they go there, they say, listen, if you are there, you, you need to actually at least just try it once. And they are quite adventurous when they describe some of the things that they eat. But then I thought, you know, that's actually not so spectacular because in South Africa, um, a lot of people will eat certain types of foods that I might not want to eat. For example, mumpani worms wouldn't appeal to me, but, but in some cultures in Africa, they love to eat fried mumpani worms. And, and there's a group of people that I'm going to be interviewing soon who make uh, flour out of crickets. And they sell oh, yeah. biscuits and muffins and cakes. And when you eat the muffins and cakes, you cannot tell that they're made with cricket flour. And when people criticize and say, how can you use insects? You know what their response was? That 80% of the world's population include insects in their diet. It's the 20% that are rather myopic when it comes to... You know, it's, it's about a, an attitude change. So if you ate yeah. it without knowing, you'd go, this was delicious. And when they tell you it's got crickets, and you're like, oh, blah, 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 blah. can't believe I just ate a, a, a creature like that. But at the end of the day, it's a source of protein, and it, it might even help from a, a, a world population point of view to, to, I don't know if it's cheap, but, but certainly uh, you could make lots of it. And then, of course, um, I think Tessa wanted to know something about Petra, so let's check her question again, but she also wants to know, what did you think of Indian foods? Because when you're in India, of course, you've, you've got to try some good curries. Did you give that a go? Oh, yeah. I love India food. Um, we, uh, yeah, we had an amazing dinner in New Delhi. It was by far one of my favorites. I love curries. <laughs> wow. And then, um, let's see, she asked about Petra. She wanted to know when you describe Petra as, as a modern wonder. Um, obviously, it, it must have been built that way because it couldn't have been natural. Um, why would someone build something like that in the mountain? Um, well, if the, the landscape out there, um, that's, that's kind of what they have to work with, you know. And, um, yeah, so they built it because that's what they had, and it is, it's, it's amazing that they're able to carve out this this village in stone. I mean, it's 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 absolutely amazing. It's really really cool. Wow. I mean, I'm always amazed at, at that thing. But now, when are you going to make the seven natural wonders of the world your next goal? Ah, yeah. I mean, I would love to. I think that's going to take a lot more time because they're kind of all over the place. Um, and well, they're the a little harder aren't. to get to. The others are all over huh? the place too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess uh, there, it takes a little bit longer to get from, you know, the airport to that natural wonder. So um, I, I, I've looked into it. I, I think I would need about a few months to pull it off uh, to really experience the wonders. Uh, and so who knows? Maybe that's definitely on my bucket list. So. Good, good, good. Uh, did you when you came to, to, to Cape Town? Did you go up Table Mountain at all? I I didn't go to Table Mountain. We were um, I I saw it, but I, I was not able to do it. Um, we were there for the wedding of my sister-in-law, who is South African, um, and so we had a lot of other things planned. But it's amazing. I would love. I'm planning on coming back to South Africa. Okay, so that the was, deal that is. When you come huh? to Cape Town, when you come to Cape Town, I will take you up Table Mountain. Yes. And you can hold me to it. <laughs> I have no excuses now. I gotta come. I'll bring my go. nieces. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And then of course Sebastian will show you around Kerala, and we've got Shannon who will show you around Taiwan, and of course we have Lamo who will show you around Lithuania, and Eli maybe will show you around Australia, but Australia's a a big place. I think, Eli, you out in Melbourne. You can give me a thumbs up if you're in Melbourne or you're in Sydney. What? No, no, no. Sydney? Uh, you can un unmute. Let me unmute you. <laughs> let me unmute him. And then he can tell us where he is. Just click on the microphone and then you can tell us where you are. You see, a lot of people have never I mean, used... I actually... I lived in Melbourne as well. Oh, you Australia. lived in Melbourne. Oh, well, then you've, yeah. you've seen... Then, sorry, Eli, there's nothing more to see in Australia. She's lived in Melbourne, and that's pretty much everything in Australia. <laughs> so let me quickly get a photograph of Eli looking all perplexed and confused at technology. I, I love the fact that a lot of people are, are getting to use 
a Google Hangout for the first time and, and are realizing the power that we could have from one, two, three, four, five, six. We've had about six or seven different countries all taking part simultaneously, which I think is absolutely amazing. So cool. The, so now you don't have to travel the world. The world can travel with you. And, exactly. and maybe, maybe that's your next uh, thing. That I mean, obviously, on, on, on Facebook, you can do it where you can put a, a live broadcast periscope and stuff of where you are at that particular moment. But you know, an opportunity like, let's say, Google Hangout means you can have people join in and interact I suppose you could do that on Periscope too, but but here you can see all the faces, and it can be a live engagement, and people can experience your travels with you, which would be so exciting. I, mean, <laughs> I would love to go. You know, I would love to see you know Petra myself, but it's also nice to see it through someone else's eyes while they are yeah. looking and going, oh wow, you've got to see. You know, sometimes what we find interesting is not the same as what someone else would find interesting. And it's, it's lovely yeah. to, to, to almost live vicariously through other people and then go and experience it for myself and go, that is amazing. But now I think Shannon says it's too late for her to stay online. She's got her bed. What time is it in Taiwan, Shannon? It's probably about midnight. She'll type the time in now and we'll know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what time it is for, for everyone else, but I'm sure that uh, Sebastian, it's pretty late for you. It's one in the, oh, one in the morning for Shannon. And Sebastian, mm. you're probably sitting at about 10 o'clock at oh, past midnight for her. Yeah. So Govinda says it's 10:46 in Nepal, so it's not too late, not too bad. And 10:30 in India, and I'm sure in Australia it's like what, one o'clock in the afternoon with the sunshine, something like that. <laughs> well, what I do want to say is thank you very, very much for taking your time to to share your adventures with us. Um, I'm always excited to learn about. Uh, the, the wonderful things that, that you are going to be getting up to because what I do appreciate, and I don't think a lot of people know this, but, oh, hold on. Eli is in Lithuania. He's actually not in Australia at the moment. Ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought he was actually in Australia, but he's missing uh, Lithuania at the moment. So what I find amazing um, is that when you, when you take, for example, your, your whole life's plan, a lot of people try and find meaning in their life. And some people will go off to India and, and try and meet a guru and meditate. Some people will go off uh, uh, hiking in remote areas. Some people feel that, you know, happiness is with, with money. And, I mean, everyone's got their own secret formula for what makes them happy. But what I find ironic is that when it comes to actual happiness, you know, a lot of us will go and look. Is your, your computer about to die any second? Yeah, it's about to die. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, and, I'm and, back. Uh, so, so some people, they look for happiness in so many places, but the one place that they don't look for happiness is within themselves. You know, yeah. it's, it's about what makes you, and, and some people say, you know, if you do this, you will be happy. If you go there, you will feel happy. But at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter where you are, it's what makes you feel happy within. And sometimes it can be the smallest thing. It could be a musical note. It could be a, a letter yeah, that someone wrote. Those are the Those important are the bits. Now, Eli, I think your, your microphone is on. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to put you on mute. Yeah, no. no, I want to talk. I want to... Oh, now they've switched the lights off. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> They're trying to get rid of you. Are, are these, is this a sign? <laughs> the computer went off. The lights went off. We're waiting for number three, the trifecta. And these are nothing after what you think. Yeah, I'm like 10 o'clock. Everyone, everyone wants me to leave. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I want to say thank you very, very much for giving of your time. And I certainly ask you to just do one thing. You need to look at the camera and smile so we can get one or two screenshots. Everyone has to smile at the camera. There we go, and one more, and got it, excellent, and hold on, stay there, Eli, we want to get one of Eli, and there we go, and Lema, I now realized who it was in the picture with him, and then of course Govinda, and Govinda's daughter must have gone to sleep, and we've got one of Sebastian, 
And of course, we need one of Tessa. There we go. And we've got lots of you guys. Excellent. So thank you so much for giving up your time. We are going to be following all your adventures on your blog. <laughs> and, and obviously on Twitter, hopefully, you'll be tweeting out some of the exciting things that you're doing. And I've got a filmmaker friend of mine that I want to introduce you to that lives out on your side. I don't know if you've met Nirvan Malik um, from Kane's Arcade. No? I'll send you all the details because you guys oh. certainly you, you, you think alike, and that's a good thing. So for the rest <laughs> of you that joined us, thank you very much. If you have any other questions, please email them to me or pass them on to me, and I'll forward them on to, to Megan, and hopefully she can answer those for us. But I know that we're keeping you, and you've got to go and live some of your life's adventures because you are a life embracer, and we wish you all the best of luck, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay.